This week, Three Sides of the Coin, our special guest played with Paul Stanley on his solo tour, played with Paul Stanley live in Soul Station, and recorded with Paul Stanley in Soul Station. I'm not going to spill the beans on who it is. Let's see if you can figure this out, putting all that together. He played guitar. I'll tell you that much. He played guitar. This guy, cool, great stories, awesome fan, an incredible musician. This is Three Sides of the Coin, talking all things KISS. I want to rock and roll all night. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Three Sides of the Coin. I, I can't keep track of who's in and out of this show anymore. I mean, last week, Ed was here the whole time and Mark wasn't. This, wow, we, did, we took last week off. There was no show last week. Oh, it was a freaking ass train wreck, man. What a train wreck. Although it was a blast. But, I, you know, I, no need for you to listen to it, Mark. But, man, when, when Mark had some technical issues and we're just like, no worries. Izzy said he's available. Mark's like, later. So Izzy joins us literally at the last minute, I just hit the record button and we just start talking. And I'm like, you know what? Cause I was telling Tommy before and I'm like, I'm just tired, tired of technical issues. Izzy, you're running the show this week. He's like, what do you mean? I go, I don't know. It's just your show. You decide what we do. So we all know Izzy's crazy and we let him set the show topic and the discussion and everything else. And halfway through the show, Dr. Fuck Ralph Vieira jump, jumped in and joined us. And that split second where Ralph joins, Izzy's face is like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Just that boy last. last. You know what's crazy? Today, I, I, I get here. I turn the computer on. No problem. No fucking internet comes right up. No, no issues whatsoever. I, I don't know. You know, that's three sides of the coin. We've been that way for. 10 years now it's like one well, week everything works know, great and the next week nothing works it's been literally months if not longer since i've had any problems and then just fuck last tuesday i fuck if it wouldn't even i couldn't get anything and then skype would pull up so i knew i had a connection of some sort but then that didn't work i'm like you gotta be fucking kidding me now, that's how come I was like, you know what? Fuck this. I'm done. It, it, Just, to, to, Tommy and I knew that if Mark hadn't been fed and he's having serious technical issues, yeah. just let him go. Yes. Just it let was, him go. Uh, it's better for everybody. Yeah, it was. It really was. You know, then I, I, I went upstairs, went for a bike ride. Everything was. Uh, Worked everything out was that frustration forward. on the pedals. I really did. I really yeah, did. Yeah. So, so I don't have, I don't have, com well, I, we don't have comments because Ed, who? We'll be here later in the show, but then leaves. Isn't here Who's to read yeah, uh, Izzy's our other guy comes in every now and then. At some point, we really should just make Izzy permanent and make Tommy the go-to <laughs> bottom of the barrel guy. Who? <laughs> hey <-o. laughs> oh, Izzy's always a blast, but, you know, show must go on. I'm actually the one that's been having technical issues as I've, I've been setting up stuff in my home office now because Thule is going to be homeschooling for the rest of this year. So it's like, all right, don't go into the office anymore. So I'm dealing with internet connection issues. And for the last two weeks, if you've paid attention to the shows, you'll notice there's probably strange edits where it just goes from one conversation into something else. That's because there was... 15 seconds of dead air in there because my internet freezes up that didn't happen today although i will i will warn you zoom had an issue with recording just the very beginning of our guest this week so oh, just really? the beginning yeah zoom is yeah it's every time i hear zoom only only people our age. Do you remember the thing on PBS? We're going to Zoom, Zoom, Zoom. zoom. Remember that? Yep. It, yep. I, I, every, time I, every time I hear the word Zoom, I'm like, that's what I think. I think of the I know. TV show. 
Yeah, That's we're too funny. old. We're dating ourselves. So anyway, bear, when our guest does show up here, bear with uh, the the start of it. We miss a little bit of the beginning, but it's an incredible discussion. Um, I don't think there's there's not a lot of Kiss news. Ace Fraley's uh, album single is out, Space which we Rocket. well we've we've heard the whole record. We just got gonna... yeah, we just got the whole record yesterday and today so we are planning to do a full track by track review of it i'm thinking like september 1st we'll record something like that because we got a guest next week and then we're open so we'll give you a full track by track of origins to origins volume I, two I'm, I'm just gonna say this uh, it, it's i and i liked origins one i think this varies it very happy with uh of course, you know, we're going to get into it deeply in a couple of weeks. But for those of you out in, uh, in uh, you know, three sides land, um, man, I, I, I'm very excited for the release. I can't wait for everyone else to hear it. And thank you, Ken, for trusting us with, yeah. uh, with uh, getting it. But you Ace fans, and I'm one of them. Hey, matter of fact, uh, in the rotation again. In the just rotation because, is an Ace shirt. Well, you know what? I actually wore this a few weeks ago, but I wear this one to work, so – I, as you can tell, I'm wearing, you know, I just hurried up, ran downstairs, threw the, the hair up underneath the hat and no shower for me. So, um, you know, I can't wait to go, uh, go jump in the shower and eat after this is done. But, but, and, and actually, you know, um, <laughs> I don't even know if I, by the time, by the time you watch this, it will have happened, but. I'm playing an ace gig, or I'm playing a kiss gig this weekend, and it uh, should be interesting here in in, in Michigan. So. Is that your yearly kiss gig party? I it it is. It's it's. It, it, I don't know. The club owner wants us to do it. Some of my other friends who play in bands, they've been playing at some places. They have the seating set up a little weird, but we were asked to play and. Um, it's put this way. This show was, this is like the fourth time it was supposed to happen. We were supposed to play two gigs in April. Now keep in mind, this is totally separate from left for dead. These are just my friends um, who are also in local Detroit bands. We're all just big kiss fans and we get along so well. I love those guys. We have a, we have a lot of fun and we just do two sets, but we play, I mean, we're all really good musicians. So we play the songs well and we have a ball and you know, it's, it's, it's always a good time. I, again, this is, this is the I think eighth or ninth year that we've been doing this, and we just play a couple times a year, and it's always super well attended. And 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 trust me, this is this is this is not political, but this is something that that hap I I never shop. I'm not a shopper, and my son just bought a house, and he moved into his very first house that he bought, you know, and uh, over the weekend, which today's Tuesday, so this was Sunday, just two days ago. I'm, I, this may be embarrassing. I, I, unless I'm shopping for records or if I just need to go to the local store and grab milk or something, I don't go into stores. I just don't. Liz does all that. I went in to a Walmart on Sunday. First time I'd been in a Walmart a couple of years. You probably picked the most optimum time to go into a Walmart, man. Certainly the first time I'd been in a store like that since the pandemic started back in whatever. February, March. Whatever. Now I don't feel so bad about playing a gig. Again, this is just an, this is just an, a, a neutral observation. When I walked in that place, there must have been, it was a sea of humanity. There must have been a few thousand people in there, and I'm not underestimating. There is literally, maybe that's one of the reasons I can remember this whole, because it's, it's so shocked me. There was 24 at least, I'm guessing, from 18 to 24 checkouts. All of them were 10, 10 people deep checking out. I couldn't believe that. And don't get me wrong, everyone was, you know, most people were married, if not all, all were wearing masks and everything. But I got to admit, I, I just went, um, why can't we have 100 people in a place to watch my live music. That was the first thing I fucking thought. I'm like, 
I mean, if you want to talk about science, it's, this is okay. This has been going on from fucking day one. I, I, I think it. I think it all comes down to what is marked an essential business versus a non-essential business, and who's got the influence to make their businesses marked essential versus non-essential. Meaning, somebody like Walmart, and honestly, I would think yes, they are. They they're essential. You need to go to a Walmart to constantly get supplies but they've probably got a lot more money to lobby politicians than the local bar owner does yeah, and, and again I, I i don't want to make this political at all but as a human being in the time of something that's going on like this there's a whole lot of politics going on man oh, God, because yes. if 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 you again this is just something i did sunday just two days ago, I couldn't believe what I saw. That's all. Again, you know, I, I guess maybe I, you know, my wife does the shopping. Like I said, I, I, I'm just somebody who picks up milk on the way home and stuff. And, and to be fair, Liz does a lot of, uh, and I know all around the country, you know, she goes to the shopping center. She calls, puts her thing in, you know, Wednesday, they load up her fucking car for her and she goes, she doesn't even have to go in the store. But, I got to admit, man, that's when I'm like, hmm, thousands of people in an enclosed place. It's, it's, it, 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 it is, like you said, so political, and it's just the crazy rules. Now, again, I'm not going to get into who's influencing writing the rules, but here's a perfect example. Like out here, you know, we've been tightening and loosening restrictions and all this other stuff, but it's like a bar can't be open inside to serve people drinks you can serve people sitting outside but if they serve food then you if the bar serves food then they're considered a restaurant and then they can serve inside with all Michael, the social distancing rules that's so, exactly how our gig is happening because so, so, they serve food. yeah so so here the, the 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 funny part is katrina was telling me somebody she knows owns a bar I don't know, somewhere north of here. And they were shocked to learn that all they got to do is go out and buy hot dogs and potato chips and sell hot dogs and potato chips from behind the bar. And now they can serve customers inside because they're a restaurant. So I, I you know, right. I'm not getting into the right or wrong. That just illustrates how freaking crazy. Yes. That's, that's what are. I wanted. Yeah, that's what I wanted to, I guess, air a little bit of my frustration just for the fact that, you know, we're okay to, to go in and thousands of people I, doing I, every, buying everything from underwear to, to, to you know, Fruit Loops. I mean, yeah. it was in a store that big and I'm, and that, I, I got it out. I'm like, huh? Can't go to church. Can't do this. Can't I, do this. I remember the the, 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 yeah, big, the biggest jaw dropping moment for me was back in March when all of this started happening, and restaurants were completely closed, but they could do takeout. And all of a sudden, within one week, restaurants were allowed to sell liquor as takeout from their bar, so you could order a margarita in a glass and pick it up and take it out. And I'm like. Wasn't last week it illegal to have an open glass in your car? <laughs> now this week, it's an essential business. <laughs> no, this was this was decades ago, but I remember. Matter of fact, uh, who was the guy that took over for Bob Barker? Um, oh, big guy. yeah, the guy from Cleveland. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. He had the TV Drew show. Perry. Drew, Drew Carey. Yeah. Drew Carey. Drew. Drew. Yeah. It's Drew Carey, isn't it? Anyways, Drew, but Drew Carey, yeah. he, did this, he did this bit about Ohio, and it was the first time I'd seen it. For all of you in, in Ohio, here in Michigan, we didn't have drive-through, uh, you know, what was it? Drive they're, they're like drug stores or whatever, right. but convenience store. I, I'm like, you can fucking pull your car right into a convenience store, literally, and they'll put fucking beer in your car. You pay for it and leave. Because I'll never Drew Carey did this bit. He's like, you know, in Ohio they have the whatever they drive through convenience stores. He's like, for the drunk driver on the move, <laughs> can't stop. <laughs> yeah, I remember when I first saw this was like decades ago. 
as a kid, our family was on vacation in Florida. And I remember decades ago, the drive through liquor stores in Crazy. Florida, where it is literally, imagine the self-serve car wash, but it's just longer. And you pull in, guy jumps out from a little little office and they, what do you want? I want a case of this and a keg of that. And you're right. They just load it in and you just keep on driving. I'm just like, is this legal? Is this right? I can't have an open container, but man, I can just drive right in, pick it up and keep, it's just, it, it just illustrates right now the absolute craziness of everything that's going on. And, and to this day, I could still call my Mexican restaurant right down the hill which I can't eat inside, but I can order two margaritas to go. Go down, drive down there. They'll come out and hand me two margaritas and glasses, and I can just drive on by. You, you know what you just described? That's one of the, another reason I'm so excited about Saturday playing. Cause when I'm, I guess being in the drummer, I'm a little bit lucky. I'm, I'm set back. I'm by myself. You know, I easily have the you know, distance around and stuff. But – it's just to do something fucking normal and kind of like what our guest coming up, you know, I've been playing drums for over 40 years. It's what I do. You know what I mean? You it's want to play. You just want to fucking amen. You just want to fucking play. And I cannot wait to click off that, <laughs> yep. that opening tune, man. And just because, you know, when it really, if, if you, are a musician you and you played in us enough gigs or if you if you've never done it when you start the set at least for me you know there's that there's that that uh, part and where bob seeger and it's a, a matter of fact I've, I've put this on my facebook site before the lyrics from turn the page where it says out there on the spotlight i'm a million miles away when if if if, if you play in a band if, that when you hit the stage man I don't know if you want to call it religious or whatever that feeling for that next hour I'm on fucking cruise control and you'd have to physically take a chisel to get the smile off my face. I, I am just so in the fucking zone and I'm, I need that, man. I, I can't wait for that feeling. You know, I can't, it's like a drug. I cannot yeah. wait to, to do that. And I'm so excited, you know, so I, you know, again, if I end up fucking dead in a month in a hospital, you don't know why, but um, <laughs> we'll send you a I, kiss I, ventilator. There you go. Hopefully but it works uh, better than your kiss router. <laughs> exactly. So hey, guys, look, I'm not, I'm also, I, I just want to be perfectly clear. This is a very serious thing. I get it and everything. Um, but you know what? Um, it is crazy. You know, Let's just leave it at it, that. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's I just, absolutely crazy. Um, so this week we've got, a really cool special guest mm -hmm. um, Mark brought to us via his friend. Should we mention your friend? Yes, because uh, Eric's er like, er 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 Eric Singer brought this guest to Mark. Mark hooked it up. Um, we are joined by Rafael Morera, and I hope I didn't slaughter the name. I apologize if I did. But Rafael has been in Paul Stanley's recent solo band, solo tour. He's been in Soul Station. He's recorded with Paul on Soul Station. He's a huge Kiss fan. And he's just an incredibly accomplished musician on his own right. So he sits down for almost two hours with us and talks about Paul and talks about the solo tour and talks about Soul Station and talks about growing up a Kiss fan and just talks music with us. And it was really cool. I mean, he's just got such a love and passion for music and Kiss. It's incredible. So Yeah, great guy. And let, uh, it, let it roll because it's, you know, it's an insight into the Soul Station a little bit. Not a lot. There, I wouldn't say there's any bombs that he dropped. Um, but it's great to hear from somebody who's actually in Soul Station with Paul. Want to get your official three sides of the coin logo and shocker tee? Now you can. We ship worldwide. Get yours online at shop.threesidesofthecoin.com. We're 
very McCartney-esque in ways because he wouldn't play the root note. He'd play around it. Um, a great example of that, if you put it this way, if you're just a music, excuse me, if you're just a Kiss fan and don't understand, listen to a song like Ladies Room. Gene doesn't follow the, the guitar lines. He plays around them. Listen specifically to the bass. That's a really good example of, uh, of Gene Simmons type bass playing, which is really him just copying a McCartney sort of feel. I, I agree. And, and Javier, can you explain this? Um, as a guitar player to the people that don't know what does the root note mean what's the difference between playing the root note and playing around it like Mark was saying well if you play a you know if you play an A chord on the guitar the root note would be the, the, the A note and everything else would be whatever that scale so if you have a seven note scale I mean seven notes you know or in a in a in a A major Maybe Gene wasn't wasn't playing that A. He was giving more of a you know major third or the fifth. You know what I mean? So you he goes around and and it's a, it's a Motown thing. It's an old school yes, vibe. Yeah, yeah. And, okay. and and it's just great. He just have a great sound. He doesn't have to try to do this and that. Gene just have it. I in my opinion, he has it. It's easy for him. I I like how his voice is still great. Still good, you know. He still yeah. has that yeah, voice. The, the bass playing really in Strutter too is another great example of e, of Gene playing around. You know, he's not just playing along to uh, what the guitar player is doing, which a lot of bass players do. You know, they just want to keep the the sound fat and low. Um, but uh, you know, Gene likes to have some fun with it. And you're absolutely right. And it's funny because, uh, you know, our mutual friend and I talk about that sort of stuff too, so. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. I, I um, Kiss is basically a rock and roll band. If we go back and listen to the riffs, yes, they experiment, experimented and, and it, you know, there's, there's a proggy side to Kiss eventually, so, certain albums and records. But basically, they're a rock and roll band, and I, I love that. And, and I think Gene went on that route as well, you know, old school rock and roll. And I mean, you can mix it all, you know, Motown and, and McCartney and all that stuff. Well, yeah, I mean, you just got to look at who influenced Gene, but Kiss in general back in the 70s. It, you know, it, it, I think to some extent, it could shock Kiss fans. I mean, to, to realize how much of an influence, let's put it this way, timelines, everything. So back in the 70s, when you, as a kid, you learn that these demons on stage are actually heavily influenced by the Beatles, you're kind of going, what? <laughs> how, how does that happen? But true. over the years here, we, we, can, we, can just, we can learn why that happened. And that's, that's what gives Gene and Paul um, you know, their, their style, their sound. Yeah, I, absolutely. I, um, but you know, going back to the gene thing. So I asked Paul, Paul, should I give him a compliment? Cause it was there hanging out with, with Paul and Eric and Tommy. And then Gene came and sat down and Paul, no, tell him he's going to love it, <laughs> which it, it was, it was great. You know, it was great to give him a compliment. Awesome. He was very happy. I was like, wow. Is that what it takes? I didn't know. It's like, Is it because, because nobody else in the band ever compliments Gene? <laughs> they yeah. know him too well. <laughs> they know Gene well, I guess. Yeah. But I do love it, man. It's part of my upbringing and my childhood. And, and it's, uh, it's awesome, you know, to have, to have had this experience so far, you know. So, well, so go ahead, Tommy. Well, I was just going to ask, so you were born in Brazil, how did you make your way to the States? And I'm assuming, did you come right to LA or how did that happen? Um, well, I was going to school in the capital of my state in the South in Brazil. Uh, and I told my parents, look, I, I play music. I'm a musician. I can't do this. So I convinced my parents to let me study music in LA, a musician's institute. Oh, nice. And uh, so that was, um, that was my education, you know. Um, so I went to school here. 
I, 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 I won a couple things like in school, like the GIT masters and for my writing and guitar playing. And, and then they gave us a few students uh, this scholarship once we graduated. And every six months we would uh, do showcases for labels and stuff like that. So I sort of, uh, okay, let me do this, you know, let's see what happens. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was a very weird and natural sort of a path that was, I believed in myself, I wanted to do music, so that's how it, it all started. And I ended up lending a big gig with Christina Aguilera back in 2000, fresh out of school. And my first show was Saturday Night Live with Christopher Walken, more cowbell. Oh, nice. <laughs> excellent. Yeah, it's crazy. I was just uh, young in my 20s and doing yeah. that. And uh, it was all new to me. I was very happy. It wasn't the music that I sort of uh, wanted to be a part of, but it was a huge production, great musicianship. Since I was leaving school, I sort of uh, invested a lot of my time learning all their styles, being open to everything. I was already a, a rock guy. I mean, I grew up playing rock. Rock is my life. And uh, so I kind of wanted to be good at a, a little bit of everything. I was kind of open-minded and being uh, – I, I applied myself to that. And, um, and that's what I got, you know, <laughs> which was amazing right. because she was huge at the time. And well, I started very talented, so. very, one, of, one of the most talented in her generation, for sure. And then, you know, once I got to gig with her, I started to play with other people in that same uh, uh, genre and, 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 and sort of on the same, you know, I, I went on tour with Pink for five years. That was my gig. And I, oh, nice. I, I was able to bring four 412s on stage and really bring the rock Very cool. to her gig and sing with her, do duets. And, and because she was coming off like a, a record with Linda Perry, so somebody sort of put that bug in her, you know, into her, like the, the rock and roll thing. So it was a good uh, time for me to be playing. I ended up, you know, playing with Slash and, and uh, Richie Sambora and... Uh, various great like musicians and rock and roll celebrities. I mean, we call celebrities, but great rock and roll people, man. Musicians that I got to play with while uh, playing alongside with Pink. Steven Tyler was one of one of them. We done some performances with him. So you know, I I'm very grateful. You know, one thing led to to another. I ended up landing a a rock and roll show in America, in the U.S., which was stellar because you want to hear from people. You want to, you want to, yeah. when, you're, when you're on tour with Pink, her crowd is not necessarily rock and roll or knowledgeable on guitar and right. things that we all share. And so playing on Rockstar and getting a feedback from the American crowd was huge for me. I felt... But I felt at home, you know, I was in L.A. playing. How, how, did, uh, how did you get the gig on Rockstar? I was on tour with Pink in Europe. And her, uh, Cher's MD, musical director, he saw me play. And he used to play with Nelson and Whitesnake and okay. a bunch yeah. of rock and roll 80s bands. And uh, saw me play and he invited me to audition with him for for the tv show which was really cool and uh so we ended up getting that show paul stanley used to watch that show we got a phone call the next it's amazing thing, you know, how i'm playing with happen. yeah i was playing with paul stanley and i really deep inside love kiss out of yeah i'm sure all the guys in the band loved kiss but i can tell you i'm i was very much into it that's as a cool. little boy and just watching. so 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 the first the first time you're you you're meeting paul and playing with him where you just bite your tongue go, tongue going i can't go fanboy this early i've got to stay cool i gotta look cool here for a while before i sit down and go so paul tell me about that, tell me about that. how long did <laughs> my, it take for you to crack 
<laughs> Mike, that's a good question because we all went to have dinner with Paul Stanley and Doc. That's the first thing we did once we accepted, you know, the, the invitation to go on tour. So sitting across from Paul, man, you know, with a shirt, open shirt, the, the hair, I was like, oh, that's Paul, man. I can't believe it. <laughs> that was a tough one for me, you know. It's like I grew up, you know, dreaming about it. Right. I dreamt about it, dreamt all day long. I, I was good in school, but I didn't, don't remember anything in school. You know, I don't remember anything. I just dreamed of Kiss and being a rock and roll guitar hero and blah, blah, blah. And it, it, so all that stuff came back to me a little bit when, when we're having dinner with Paul. Paul has always been very upfront about anything, about how he wants things. He, he is a gentleman. He's a great guy. It's, it's been a great experience so far, you know, doing the DVD playing kiss music it was just crazy good just too much fun every so, night you know when did you first see kiss in concert wow that's a good question mm. wow did, did, did you see them on the creatures tour when they played no, south america I was, I was too young i i wasn't i wasn't i wasn't close to any uh cities that they played I, I don't think I, I was far from Rio or Sao Paulo. I was inland. You know, my dad okay. was an agriculture engineer, so he owned land and farms, and I grew up in that sort of. Uh, it's funny that you got the rock and roll bug being a farm kid. I mean, where did it. Everyone did loves it? rock and roll as a kid in Brazil, uh, especially in, in inland, in the south of Brazil. We all love rock and roll. We all grew up with it. I especially well, did, the well, English. How, how did you? How were you turned? Like, where did you see? I mean, was M, You know, the music videos, or was it? Was there classic rock stations? Was it? Was there what? an older friend who had a Kiss album that you saw that introduced you to it? What was that first action that took? Well, place? I grew up with two older brothers. We had a band, a trio. My parents, my dad bought all the stuff, so. We were playing music since we were little. My first electric guitar, I was eight years old, and I was performing with my two older brothers. We had a power trio. So we were heavily influenced by the English, you know, musicians, you know. Zach yeah, but, but where, did, where did you hear that at? I mean, was there a lot of radio down there? We had, we, we, yeah, but we had older cousins, and they were all into rock and roll. My, we had cousins that came over to the house, with like those old yellow Suzuki's and just, you know, dirt bikes and just yep. with yep. the stones, tong and I mean, they were rock and rollers, man. I mean, we were, and they were like, you guys gotta listen to Stones and Zeppelin and Kiss. I mean, that was it. Once we saw Kiss, it really had an impact on us because I think it was happening at that time. It was kind of a fresher for us, for little guys, like, wow, Kiss is crazy, you know. Look at this brand, and that's you know, you, Rolling Stones had a huge brand as well. Uh, so yeah, man, we went from from you know ACDC, old Iron Maiden, the first two albums, you know, with, with Paul Diano. I mean, so good. You can't go wrong with that music. No, old old Black Sabbath, but Kiss was our baby. Kiss was it. I have pictures where I. I have Gene's makeup on with a tongue, and, but I love Paul in Ace, you know? It's like, yeah. but then you do the Gene's makeup because he was the tough guy. You know? But isn't it still kind of, because like Brazil's on my bucket list. I so want to come and visit your country someday. And I get the impression that rock and roll is still very, very strong there in the same way it is in London. It is huge, especially with people in cities like Sao Paulo or, or in the South, people love rock and roll, man. It's always been a huge thing. But, and Yeah, they sing the melody lines in the concerts. I mean, there's some incredible, as a matter of fact, not only just Kiss, but especially Iron Maiden. They're, they're never, like, oh my, it's insane what they do down there. Insane. But, um, go ahead, but I'm Tom. Curious, 
I'm curious to get your, your opinion on this. Why do you think, why is it that rock and roll has still maintained such a stronghold in different countries like that? And here in America, it's, it's really wishy-washy. We see it more, you know, like in the Midwest, but it seems like the trend in music is constantly changing in the U.S., whereas it stays steadfast in so many other places. Um, I think the Los Angeles and New York is, is, you know, they're 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 setting trends. You know, Tommy, it's always been that way. Whatever happens in LA, New York, sort of shapes um, how everybody else li listens to music and stuff. And I think um, Brazil is a rock and roll country, as I said. <laughs> there's there's a lot of similarities with the states. You know, we have a huge country uh, culture and when I say country I mean everything that you might think of country like horses and rodeos we're huge on rodeos man there's rodeo people everywhere competing and I, I, there's a lot of that we retain a lot of that uh, in our culture that we love rock and roll we love th that English thing you know they started because it had a heavy influence on the U.S. market in musicians. Because, you know, we talk to Paul Stanley and you hear, you know, him talk about Zeppelin. It's like, wow, this guy is listening to Zeppelin so much or Beatles. Yeah, you know? I just think it's great, you know, because it, sometimes you feel, or at least I have in the past, I felt like such an outsider once the musical trend started to change. Right. You know, and I, I remember, you know, being in high school and driving around and, the lakes, we have a lot of lakes where I live, and, and listening to Van Halen cranked at the top volume or Kiss or Cheap Trick or Black Sabbath, Aerosmith, Deep Purple, or whatever. And I always just thought, well, why wouldn't the kids of today be doing that but with Greta Van Fleet and some of the younger bands? But you don't. Everything I hear when I'm on the, the road at these stoplights is rap. I, 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 do, I do agree with you. I have had this conversation with uh, some of the guitar companies. And I don't think they have done a very good job in, in actually promoting the great people. It, they're doing a very mm -hmm. poor job, if you ask me. Interesting. Uh, it's terrible what they did. And, and that's in any industry, any industry, not only music or rock and roll. You need new heroes in order yeah. for you to keep yep. carrying the flag. Yeah. If you're a guitar company and you start promoting the terrible guitarists, they are not guitarists. They're just celebrities with a guitar. You start killing everything. Kiss wasn't a celebrity band. They became huge. They fought for it. You know, they they heard a lot of negative criticism when they were doing what they were doing. But once they they became Kiss, we. I mean, we didn't see that. I saw Kiss as Kiss. So, yeah, give right. it to me. I love it. Uh, you can't stop on Slash. You can't. Slash's great. You know, you, it's, he's a guitar player where people can relate to him. Yeah. Why do you just... stop promoting great guitar players and start promoting? Why do you start promoting? This is not against anybody, but Jonas Brothers, those guys cannot play guitar. So stop promoting that. Your guitar company promote the great guys that are coming. That so are always, there's always an influence on the younger crowd, and we need that. So if you I, stop on Slash twenty plus years ago, who else came? Yeah, Joe Bonamassa is great. It's great, but it's just a guy. Let's do it. Who is playing with? Why? Why? I don't understand it. You're not going to have anybody playing your instruments if you don't promote. The new LeBron James, whatever, or the new yeah. Phelps, you know? I, I, I've talked about that on the show before, and I think you can relate as a guitar player that, you know, I, when, when we were younger, if you put Jimmy Page, uh, uh, you know, Ted Nugent and, and, you know, Richie Blackmore and Ace Frehley, you know, Alex Lifeson, if you just put them in a room and just ask them to play an A chord, you'd go, that one's Van Halen, that one, you, you could, because they had a, a tone. And, and when you brought up Slash, 
he was like the next generation of slash could just noodle for three seconds and you could tell it was him same thing with somebody like zach wilde you can, you, you can listen to him noodle for a couple seconds and you go okay that one's zach wilde but there's not enough of that now no the, the i agree tones, especially now for heavy rock are all just junk 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 it's it's like there's no individuality anymore you know i agree, and, and, I, agree and I, think, the, I tell you what say what you want about the guys from Greta van fleet who i i think are wonderful but that guy that's got a great fresh tone i mean it, it's it's sure do they you know the repackaging of the zep feel but man when i when i put that record on it just puts a smile on my face it's no so I, I i've seen it uh, i've i've heard it and i i'm 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 thinking like you like I, I do like how unconventional uh, the singer is. He's yeah. got a great voice, but he comes he comes on stage with like a Roman sandal, like <laughs> like a like a little bit of a hippie young kid, with you know like. But he sings so good, and it just it breaks. You don't have because to be perfect. He's cool. And correct. He, and but walk he doesn't out. sing a normal melody line because Robert, I mean, look, obviously he's very much influenced by Robert Plant. But one of the things that made Zeppelin, Zeppelin was, you know, they didn't have the same rhyming schemes that say, you know, Kiss or ACDC or a lot of the pop. Plant's voice was like a separate instrument. You know, especially in a song like Trampled Underfoot or something, the, the way that he rapid fires his, again, it's almost like its own. And, and of course, there's, there's you know, that, that, that isn't always the case because you listen to something like Black Dog and it does have the distinct sort of, you know, you know vocal that a lot of other songs do. But, but if you listen to a good part of the catalog, the way he is, the inflection of his voice, the way he used his voice. He just, he wasn't, Plant just wasn't another singer. I mean, Plant. I, I agree. And, and that, yeah, that I kid agree. from. Yeah. No, I agree with Greta what you're saying. Well, you, you, you know, I, I think all of it comes back to, at some point, developing and, and promoting talent disappeared. I and, agree. And it all became about developing the next moneymaker. It wasn't about talent. It was, can we make money in the next quarter off of this person, this musician, this guitar? Okay, if we can, great. But if they stop making money six months from now, forget about them. Let's go on to the next one. Where, you know, all of us as we we're growing up, it was about talent. I mean, it wasn't like Eddie Van, Van Halen was here one year and gone the next year. It was an album, a tour, an album, a tour, an album, a tour. All of these great musicians, that's what it was. They were given the opportunity to become great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Kiss, it's just like Rush. A lot of those, they didn't hit right away. You know, it took a few records. Judas Priest, another great example. It took a few years. You know, they had, by the time they started having hits, those bands, Cheap Trick, another one. By the time they hit, they had a back catalog you could go back. Hey, they had three albums Check. worth of material already. Yeah, but, but that's the difference between, you know, the model back then and the model now. The model now is you better, you know, you better sell a million records or you're done. Everything that, is quick fixes, man. And, and, and that, that doesn't apply just to the record labels, but it applies to, like, the guitar companies that you're talking about. They need to worry about their bottom line profit for the end of this quarter, the end of this fiscal year, and what person's got the biggest audience that could potentially sell a bunch of guitars to bring our numbers up. We don't care if they're talented or not. Can they sell guitars? That's it. It's pretty much the business, isn't it? Yeah. And, uh, well, what Mark was saying, I, I can relate to that as a kid – my biggest thing was that I had a sound that if I played, somebody would know it was me, Rafael, you know, Oh, that's Hafa. And, uh, even when I came and played with Paul, the first time we did all this, the kiss, um, tunes that he, he did. And, uh, I don't know if I can. Yeah. Grab a guitar. It'd be awesome. 
I don't know if I can hear something weird here. But anyway, sorry, guys. Uh, but anyway, uh, when we did the tour with Paul, Paul talked to us about this is not KISS. We're actually doing our own thing. You know, so when you approach KISS that way, a lot of people won't like that, right? I mean, if you do your own thing, Yes, I try to keep it close to, to Ace solos, most of the stuff, most of the songs. But I do have my own thing, you know, and it's, it's nice to be able to do that, to put your own uh, stamp on something, respecting the original, you know. And I've always been that way. In all the TV shows that I had the chance to play covers, I was able to bring who I was. We, we want to see the real person, you know, behind the guitar and, and it, because it's unique. There's nobody like that. No matter how much, you see, Tom is a great guitar player. I, I, I'm a, you know, I think he's a, a great player and he does the ace thing perfect. It's really good. It's very hard for some people to try to do the ace thing because you have your own thing so much. I think Tommy does a great job there. But there's only one ace, let's be honest. You can never duplicate ace. I thought it was interesting when um, uh, v v Vinnie Vincent came on board. He had his own makeup. That was interesting, right? I mean, didn't last, but just like Eric Carr had his own makeup and his own persona, it's kind of a cool thing. But I still love well, Kiss the way it is straight. right now. Vinny's huh? straight from Vinny's straight from Ace is playing quite a bit. Um, you know, when he do the songs live. There was there were some some solos he'd play, you know, that were ace ish, but he realized, you know, listen to what he played in Cold Gin and you know, geez a whole bunch calling Doctor Love. He didn't follow Ace's solos. He went on some in his own way, yeah. Yeah. Which I like Which it I too. I love it. At the time, it. I really enjoyed. At the time, I really enjoyed. But yeah, I, I you know. like. I like now that Tommy. Excuse me, cops more of Ace's feel, whereas Bruce didn't do that as much. You know, he didn't play the, the solos. A great song, an example like that is Firehouse. <laughs> it's never crazy the way, um, uh, Bruce played it, but you know Tommy really you know, nails the ace feel. Amazing, yeah. You know, on, on uh, some songs it works, some songs it, it, it doesn't, you know. Right. Um, well, it's part Kiss of it. Say it again, Mark, sorry. Kiss, Kiss was never jammy, you know. You're not, you know, they wouldn't go like how, you know, the, uh, a great example would be like Aerosmith. They could take a, a riff and, you know, go for 10 minutes at the end of it and, you know, and, and jam around. Kiss is very a lot more structured, so I always thought the solo should be more structured. Sure, it's like uh, you know how many times we had you know different guitar players with Ozzy, and mm. we can you know I think they all paid respect to the one before. Like Jakey Lee did pay respect for Randy Rhodes, so did Zach, but they were so unique in their but own. Don't you think? But don't you think Jakey Lee was also kind of screwed no matter what because he took a lot of heat after randy died and he came in as a guitar player and i thought that he was very talented i i agree with you i wasn't i wasn't around as as much to know what kind of pressure he was under because i was probably too young but i do like the albums you know the studio albums that he was on i love that the songs in those albums and the production i think he did a great job and I, I and, and and we don't know how bad it was for him in there. Probably tough, you know, to 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 fill those shoes. But I think Zach came in and did a, an incredible job and kept the ball rolling with his own vibe. Jake was very different too. I just always thought it was a cool thing that Ozzy had, which is you can't compare to Kiss because Kiss had Ace, and then you know guys like. That I that I I'm a huge fan too, you know Bruce and 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 Tommy and Mark, right? Mark St. John. Mark St. John. 
and uh, Vin Vinnie Vincent. It's hard, it's easier for us to say something, as, especially as a kid, <laughs> that you don't understand what's going on behind the, the curtain and behind the, the whole thing. You know, the, the chemistry in between everybody, that, that is a huge well, thing. Well, you know, and, and the one thing, you know, comparing Kiss and Ozzy, Kiss is a band. Kiss has always Absolutely. been a band. Ozzy, post-Sabbath, of course, was Ozzy Osbourne. It was him. So it, was, it would be much easier for somebody like Ozzy to just keep changing players because it's all about Ozzy. Absolutely. Where in Kiss, it's always been, yeah, it's always been Gene and Paul, but it's been about Kiss, the band. And I, and I think, personally, one thing Gene and Paul probably realized after the Vinnie Vincent, Mark St. John era was that sound of the guitar playing that those two guys brought wasn't Kiss. It wasn't rooted in what Kiss was rooted in. That was trying to be fresh and new and let's ride the, the Randy Rhodes, you know, trend of, of guys that just played, you know, crazy. They tried that for a couple of guitarists. Yeah. And they, I think they honestly probably realized that's just not who we are. We didn't it's grow It's not going to work. <laughs> Paul did not grow up being influenced by that sort of guitar playing. True. So Bruce comes back in and Bruce brings it back down to something that's more Kiss-like. I think he had a good idea of that, right? A good balance. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. great balance. And a great player, man. I always enjoy his playing a lot. Yep. He's a good guy and Tommy too. He's always been great to me and I I'm a big fan of those guys, you know. So, can you take us into your head the first time you're on stage with the Paul Stanley solo band and you're playing a Kiss tune? And Paul Stanley's right up front singing. What was going on in your head? You know, <laughs> Mike, every single show was crazy fun. Like, hard to describe. Hard to describe the shows because we would go back to the, the you know, our, our dressing room. And Paul would come in and sit down with us and have dinner with us and and we would talk about how much fun it was and how much fun he thought it was. And, and I think everyone was on the same page. There was no, no, no other way. It was, it was just a lot of fun, rock and roll, uh, songs that we all grew up with, playing next to an incredible performer. Paul is an amazing performer. It's a, it's a huge... I don't know. It's a, it's a hero of mine, you know. It's like, so playing guitar leads next to this guy every night was just too much fun. I mean, I I can only imagine because, as a Kiss fan, because I saw I saw one show on that tour at the Fillmore here in San Francisco. You know, for a fan, we were going through the same thing. It was like, this is so much fun. The show is fun. You can feel that Paul Stanley is having a blast on stage because he doesn't have the kiss monster that defines what a kiss show needs to be and what a kiss set list needs to be. Now it's Paul Stanley doing what he wants. And, you know, as a fan, you could just sense it was pure fun for everybody who was on stage. Yeah, I, absolutely. I, the other thing, Paul, Paul does things in a, in, a, in a way that you might not expect. You know, when he hired this, this rock star band, a lot of people, at least I noticed that people didn't think that was the right band for Paul. But we're all musicians, you know, we're all professional musicians. So maybe some people think it shouldn't be that way. But we love Kiss. I, I especially grew up with it. So play, playing with Paul outside of a TV studio set it was incredible i mean we really got to let it all out you know and uh, every night and just play music and not be sort of confined into a studio situation where you got to be responsible and i mean obviously we're responsible with paul 
it's just that we really had a great time, you know, just letting all out on stage, which should be, you know. Did you did you guys have any influence input on the set list? Were you sitting there as a Kiss fan, going, "Oh, Paul, you got to play this song, man! No, it would no. be so great to play." Or was it all Paul? No, I think Paul knew what he wanted to do as far as like the set list. I went to Paul's place um, just to make sure the parts were right, you know, like the the ace parts or whatever parts he thought were important. But he also gave us um, some freedoms, you know, like we were talking about. That's the reason why I brought the Aussie thing. Because when Paul does his own thing, he wanted to be a little different. He didn't want it to be another version of Kiss that didn't make sense to right, him. Right, right. And in order to do something like that, it, it would be done with Paul or Gene or, you know, anybody that goes solo, you know. So, well, so I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you no, off. No, 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 Tommy. I just to finish. I, 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 I did it a little bit like I would do a gig with Ozzy, where I will do what Paul wants. You know, Paul needs to be happy, but he right. also wants us to bring forth what we are. You know, so yeah, I had a chance to play a little bit, a little bit of guitar. You know, and, and be myself, which was great for me. And he wanted that from everyone. So then how, from your perspective, how were the audiences different when you played with him versus when you were playing with Christina Aguilera? Did you feel like more part of a band because of the music being different? or was uh, No, it's just that you, all of a sudden you're at home, right? You're playing rock. It's like, it's like, so it just know, feels better. It just feels good, man. You're just rocking out, dude. It's like a half step down, boom, less bowls. Let's rock. Let's play. Let's sweat, man. Let's play rock and roll. It's not all this cute, you know, this thing. I mean, I understand. I, I, I like music in general and I apply accordingly, but this is rock and roll and you're playing with a monster, man. This guy has been around for years, and you can tell how he deals with it, how he he's so good on stage. He's just been oh, yeah. there for many years. <laughs> it can, I wanna, I'd like to move the conversation to uh, the Soul Station stuff. How many original Paul Stanley compositions, and did you were were you were you able to write anything with this, or were you you know how did you go about your guitar parts, and uh, can you I don't know if you if you can, but what 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 Motown classics are going to be on the record? If if I don't know if you can talk about that or not. I don't know either. <laughs> But I, I think Paul wrote maybe four or five songs. I'm not sure. I don't remember. And That's the number I heard, too. Yeah, and I, I don't know if I should just, you know, there's songs that on the set that we didn't record. So I don't know which songs he's going to include uh, on the album. I unfortunately didn't write anything with Paul this time. Um, but I, you know, I respect his freedom. It's, it's Paul's project. We're all there with him. And uh, as far as recording, I sort of, uh, we did it all live, you know, one or two takes, man. And I didn't want to be the one, hey, let me do that again. Let me do that a hundred times because I'm a, 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 I'm a perfectionist. So I'm glad that I have people around me in that group that, you know, man, this is great. It's live, you know, so it's it's a better way to cut a record when everybody's playing well and live, and we got a good take. Um, so I didn't I didn't do anything as far as like I didn't do a lot of overdubs. Let's put it this way, you know, it was mostly live. I did a couple things here and there, but it was a very light album to to record on because you're not spending days and trying to fix this. Everything came out very naturally, you know, the rhythm section, Eric and Sean, or, you know, everything was pretty, pretty chill and, and fun. How big was the horn section? I think it's a, it's a three piece. Okay. Yeah, it's not a big one, but it's definitely fills in, you know, when you have like 
two keys, uh, guitar, bass, drums, uh, percussion, three singers besides Paul and myself and, and who else sings? I think Eric sings a little bit. Yeah, it's like a 12, 13 piece band. Did you guys go back and use any like classic, uh, you know, some old Fenders or did how, like your guitar choice and stuff? Did you use mostly modern stuff or did you go back and use some of the stuff from the 60s, original analog stuff? Or what, well, what I, you mean, I, my guitar choices were all like reissues of the past. You know, I had a, a 52 Tele that I have it's a, it's, a, it's a thin line and it's just a relic it's a great guitar it's my probably my best guitar uh just because it's just one of those um a 356 with the bigsby um gibson which is a very motown guitar so i i use those two and maybe a les paul a 58 uh i have an i have a bogner amp that does everything very well it's got a great clean it's a great uh distortion channel they, they it's all separate eqs the, the 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 distortion side of the amp it's it's sort of like very marshally which it's nice it's just good but i i also use a lot of the clean you know just for the the clean parts Again, it wasn't one of those records that I had a lot of chance to experiment, if you know what I mean. Sure. I, I just go there and cut it. Did, 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 did Paul produce the album himself? Um, I, I'm sure he has a lot to do with it. You know, he knows what he wants. He's very good with writing string parts. And uh, so I, I don't know as far as the credits goes, but he's got a lot of, got his hands on it. You know, what what's it like being in the studio with Paul Stanley as he's directing his album? How is he to work with? It's it's easy because Paul knows that you let the musicians do what they do at first, I think. And then it's easier to adjust. It's it's always I think it's once we know what we're doing and what we're going for i think everyone gets on the same page and then paul can make adjustments you know did paul take any solos at all meaning guitar solos or did you did he play much guitar he doesn't play guitar on on this oh, okay. band that's, at that's all kind of and and we did record together some acoustic parts which were a lot of fun you know what i mean so like you, it's you like you get together with paul you get together with paul and he's like Man, I just want to do this. It's just fun. It's just too much fun, Mark. You know. So you handled all the guitar on the record? Yeah. Every one of them? Yeah. How many? How many? I mean, how many were you doing? Some acoustic backing? I mean, how much? Like, how many uh, layers of guitar on, on most songs did you do? You know, I only did what was necessary. I, you know. As I as I was saying, I'm a very I'm a perfectionist. I'm I'm the guy that will want to spend nights in the studio if I can. In this case, we're talking about a lot of people, and with my experience in TV shows and other gigs, you want to do your thing and do it well and do it in one take if you can. You always got to be on top of things. I couldn't take a project on this size and make it about me or what I think it needs to be with the guitars and how purist I may be. I wanted to, to follow the lead and see what it's necessary and if Paul's happy, if my good friend Alex um, Alessandroni is happy, he's the musical director I recommended to Paul. By the way, his father was the guy that whistled in all the spaghetti western movies. Oh, and, cool. And he was the son of Ennio. Um, Ennio Morricone was the guy that passed recently. He did all the movies that we all probably love. And Alex's father was the guy that played all the, the surf guitars and all the whistles. And these are guys from Rome from back in the day. And I just uh, luckily ended up working under Alex with Christina and Pink. And he's a, he's a guy that knows music 
very deeply understands Motown. And when Paul asked me about someone that could uh, handle, I don't, you know, I thought it was a good thing to have an MD, you know, somebody that takes care of those things. And so I brought Alex in and he's been there since and he's been helping Paul too with the record. Well, so, so I got one last question before I have to bail. So as a rounded musician and studying like you have and playing all these different genres, I know what I think Motown is if someone asks me because I grew up listening to it as a kid. But did you have to go back and listen to a lot of the Motown music to get that feel for what it encompassed before you could be a part of this project? Yeah, I'm, I'm always going back. You know, Tommy, always. I'm always going to listen to this music, especially because you have, have to learn the stuff. If we're going to play 10 covers, what you're going to do is go back and listen to those 10. And right. by, by default, you're listening to Motown. But I've done that before with other artists, you know, that I had to play with. So I it sort of uh, it almost like made me aware of the style prior to even have that thought with Paul. Okay. You know? Is, yeah, is... I, Go I, ahead, I'm, Tommy. I, I was just kind of wondering, like, okay, so you have 10 covers, so you know you're going to listen to those songs and learn them to get the feel. But let's say Smokey... Um, I, or the Temptations, let's use that. Sure. Did you go beyond the Temptations of if there was a cover song by them and listen to a larger, broader amount of their catalog? Yeah, I listened to it. I put it on Spotify. I'll listen all day for okay. weeks. Perfect. Just like I listen to Kiss still. I still go back and listen to the music because I want to remember what gave me this fire, you know, to play rock and roll. I go back, man. I go back to listen to music. I'll just let it roll, you know, because back in the day, we listened to music. It wasn't about the video so much. Once MTV hit it, yes. But before that, it was about the music. It was about the vibe and, and what made you feel. So, yeah, I go back and, and, and do my research. Is all the recording done for the Soul Station album? Don't, don't, yeah, I don't quote me on it, but yes, <laughs> I, I think so. At least my parts, yeah. Do you, do you have any rough idea of when Paul is hoping to release it? I don't know, but I think soon. I think it's a, it's a tough time right now, as sure. we all know. It's a weird uh, world like situation, so I don't know. I don't know exactly when, but I think soon. I think he's ready. I mean, he's been wor he's kind of been working on this on and off. It feels like as a fan for a long time. Yeah, and I think it's a passion of his, right? Yes, it's like, exactly. You know, it's Motown's had a had a place in his heart as a kid, and and it's kind of a cool thing that he's still going with Kiss. You know, giving everyone all the fans out there, you know, the Kiss uh, <laughs> brand and and touring. Because it's okay. what people love. And then he can do the side projects that he enjoys on top of that. You know? so, so can you, because you kind of are in a unique situation. Tommy, take care, man. Sorry, Tommy, it's great I, to see you, man. You. It was a pleasure. Thank so you. So good to see you. We'll be in touch on Facebook and stuff. That sounds good. Yeah, hit me up whenever. Of course, Bye, man. Good to see you. Um, you're kind of in a unique situation when it comes to somebody who's worked with Paul. Can you compare being on stage and working with Paul Stanley, the rock star from KISS in his solo band, to being on stage and performing with Paul Stanley Soul Station? How are those that I mean, musically we obviously know they're very different musically. And, and having you having been on stage in both instances and being a big KISS fan gives you kind of an interesting ability to sit back and go, wow, that's a different Paul Stanley from that Paul Stanley. <laughs> yeah, I enjoyed all of it. Uh, it's just you, you, you sort of uh, go in with the mindset of let's go play rock and roll with Paul. You know, and it was a lot of fun, man. I got to tell you, Mike, it was just crazy fun. The Fillmore show was awesome. I remember 
I think everyone got stoned by just being on stage. I mean, the, weed, like, <laughs> yeah. the wave, man. It was like, oh, my God. It's just crazy. It's just like it was a good, hot vibe. At the well, yeah, yeah. I mean, add, add to that, it's just the Fillmore, the legendary yeah. Fillmore of who else has been on that same stage that you're playing on. Um, so fun. You know, and, 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 and Mark can attest to this, and any fan who's seen Paul Stanley in a solo concert, whether it was his 80s solo tour or his more recent one, it was a treat to be able to experience something so rare as seeing the guy who a week ago could have been headlining in front of 25,000 people, and there he is on a little stage in front of you with 300 people. And he's kicking ass. He's just it kicking was, ass. Yeah, it was, it was crazy fun. Ton of work as far as like we were working out every night. It was a lot of fun and it was a upbeat show. It was, it, was, it, was, uh, it was great, man, emotionally and physically to be a part of it because we worked hard uh, to play those songs. But it, it, was, it was fun every single day night uh with the, with the motown thing it's a it's a new project so it, it you know it's it's like different you're there playing with eric and it's just fun and we're playing some classics some good stuff and it's just different it's just a different you can tell that he's the same performer he is great at it he has command of it so I'm just happy that I get to learn and watch him do his thing. And, and, and from time to time, I get to play my guitar and maybe inspire people, you know? You, you, you and Eric ever feel like, hey, let's, let's put together the Motown version of Black Diamond, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> that would be something, man. That <laughs> I mean, would be if, awesome. If, if you remember back how they countryfied the God, God of Thunder during the convention tour, no, you know, I didn't see that one. Yeah, there, there's, there's a bunch of videos. When <laughs> I they, love when, that song. When they play God of Thunder on the conventions, they kind of played a, a hillbilly country version of it. <laughs> and it was just, it was hilarious. And I'm just sitting here going like, you know, you got Paul Stanley in Soul Stage. You got Paul Stanley, Eric Singer, you, all major Kiss fans. And I'm not saying the rest of the band isn't because I don't know the rest of the band well enough. Um, but you're like, wow, let's see, we could like all of a sudden pull out the Motown version of a mini kiss set here. You could, I'm, I'm sure we could, you know, it would be crazy fun. It's just a lot of, you know, like it's, I like how he does things, you know, this is a, a project. It, it has a process in order for us to come up with the album and putting it out. Everything takes its time, you know, yeah. so. I, I, I'm, I'm learning that that's how it works. It's not an easy thing to do. And uh, I'm sure we all want to see this album come out. At least put it out there and let people on, enjoy. Maybe we do some playing, you know. I, I know KISS fans are, yeah, I shouldn't say all KISS fans. but True that, many, yeah. many, many KISS fans are eagerly awaiting this because, again, he's been performing and talking about recording and doing all this stuff it feels like for years and we're just like come on give us something give us something something new and exciting and that's yeah that's a way to do it and i i'm excited about it man i i hope it does well and uh, i'm sure we're gonna see paul and kiss still for a while i hope and uh it's 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 a it's a i'm very grateful you know to be around those guys and and if I can bring something good to it, you know, that's my my. You looking goal. forward to getting Soul Station back out on the road too? Yeah, if we get if we have if we get to do some dates, I would love that, man. Because it's a great group of people. We're playing music that Paul loves. We all love. It's a it's a bunch of great musicians, you know. So. Yeah, I've been bugging Eric. I don't know why. Why? not come to Detroit. I mean, the home of Motown. You guys could sell out the Fox, man. That'd be fun. You know? I would love that. Yeah, that would be fun. The last time we played there was uh, with Paul. It was unbelievable. What an amazing yeah. time we had. <laughs> so, so what else are you, do you have, you, do you still have your own band? Cause I know you yeah. did. 
I, I do have Magnetico still. We're actually releasing a new song soon. And uh, if anybody wants to hear Magnetico, just go on Spotify. We have two albums, Mike. Uh, Magnetico Songs About the World that came out in 2009 and Death Race that came out in 2016. I just, I'm just mixing a new song that I want to put out very soon. Um, I also have, let me just show you the albums so people maybe remember when they they have a chance to see it. Um, so this is the first one, it's Songs About the World. It's a black album and, and this is um, Death Race. It's a cool artwork, post-apocalyptic. And I also have a, a solo album I put uh, put out maybe 15 years ago and it's all it's fusion it's a, it's a, an instrumental album and it's called acid guitar it's under my name Rafael Moreira and and I'm doing a lot of production writing and teaching a lot you know if anybody needs guitar playing or producing their band I offer those services in my web on my website, which is www.rafael, Rafael or Rafael, m o r e i r a dot com. Um, all the services that I provide are there, you know, either with the guitar, the writing, producing, you know. So, if anybody is interested in Hiring me for a guitar solo, a guest guitar solo, you can find it on my website. Well, you, you definitely know. got the resume. Yeah. You know, I've been very lucky. I feel like lucky. But I also wanted to do this since I was a little kid. And, and um, yeah. so, yeah, I, I, I really appreciate it, man. And I'm very thankful to, to life in general, you know, to be able to do what I love in life. And, uh, and you're 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 living a you're a Kiss fan living a Kiss fan's dream. Yeah, pretty much. I um, that's why I get along. With, you know, like I get it what we're doing, and we talk about Kiss and stuff because that's how I grew up. You know, I love it. It's All right, part so of my persona. But before we wrap up, you got to tell us what was what was one of the the Kiss questions you had to ask Paul about. Whether it was an album, a tour, or who recorded this? Because, you know, I mean, we're all KISS fans. And given that opportunity to sit down with one of our heroes, eventually you're going to say, so, Paul, tell me about what was one of those questions that you asked him? You know, it's hard for me to tell you one. I, I bug Paul a lot. But <laughs> <laughs> it's like you don't want to tell him. You don't want to remind him. That look, you. I was a big Kiss fan, you know, growing up. You don't want to keep reminding Paul of that because you know I go to his house sometimes, you know, with the whole band. We have dinner there. He's a great guy, you know, and I I understand that nowadays. And uh, in the beginning, it was very strange, as I was telling you, when we had dinner with him and Doc. It's like, oh my God, that's Paul Stanley. Look at the shirt, you know, the hair. It's like, oh my God, this is for real. But um, it. You know, the more you spend time with somebody, you know, you notice Paul's Paul and it's a person. It's like, but it's still the same, man. I don't think that will, will ever change, Mike, as you probably know, you know, mm -hmm. as a kiss. Yeah, we talked about, you know, the elder a lot. We laugh a lot about it. <laughs> it's like as a kiss fan, I like things that maybe a lot of kiss fans don't like. You well, know, that's the beauty of the of being a Kiss fan. Yeah, this band has been around for nearly fifty years. There are so many things they've done, album wise, tour wise, band member wise, that that you know gives a stupid show like Three Sides of the Coin enough material to talk about Kiss every week for a decade. Absolutely. I mean, and and everybody's going to have an opinion about it because there's no oh, the Elder sucks. No, the Elder's great. No, Vinny sucks. No, Vinny's great. It, it, right? Like, I, I actually, I was listening to, just, re, you know, put it on, I put it on The Elder again. Man, there's like three, four songs there that I really, really like a lot. 
And as you know, some of, some of our favorite bands, sometimes there's a record, there's maybe one great song. Yep. So it's not a bad record, in my opinion. It's different than, the, than the, what they were doing at the time. But I don't think it's bad. <laughs> but, I, I've, I, I agree. I mean, I've, I've said a few times on the show that I could imagine if the elder... If the band looked like Creatures of the Night, but released The Elder, it would probably have been received better. Right. Part of the problem, I mean, there's a lot of problems with The Elder, let's be honest, but one of the problems was the drastic change in the band's image. Yep. And if they still look like a metal version of Kiss, all of the Creatures look, which was one of the coolest looks ever, Yeah. the music in the elder would have probably been heard differently because right or wrong so many people listen to the music with their eyes at the same time it, it definitely happened with kiss because the their image were you know was so impactful you know so for them to change that much then it was a big big deal and i don't think a lot of people got it as a kid listening to the vinyl i got some things that i liked and my brothers love it too we all love it <laughs> so it was now, very now, funny now, to now, talk. Now, now mark has his definite completely different opinions and that and, that, and that's great but <laughs> go ahead <laughs> yeah you know there there are listen there are moments on the elder more than one where you're like wow what are they doing <laughs> what is that true but there are other moments where you're going god that sounds freaking awesome yeah, I was listening Mark, to two to, or to, three. To uh, Mark, to your very first listen of the first song you heard, you were like, yes. Yeah, Raphael, I'll share a quick, quick, quick story. I, I got the elder the day it came out. I, I rushed home and I told my, you know, one of my best friends who still liked to kiss. Keep in mind that when I always say timeline is everything, nothing, especially you know, being in high school could have been any more uncool than to rushing home from high school to get the new Kiss record. <laughs> so I get home and my parents, of course, this is before cell phones, they had a phone in their bedroom and I had my stereo set on stun and I had the oath just cranking and I just, I love you know, that song. Well, well, it's funny. Keep in mind, the you know the last album was unmasked. There was nothing, nothing that even sounded remotely like a Marshall on there. You know what I mean? Yeah. When that kicks in. I literally halfway through the song, run to my parents' room, which is a room next to mine, call my friend with the oath just blaring in the background, and I'm like, "They're back, baby! They're back!" Ah! And so the next day, I get to school, and my buddy's like. <laughs> What's what's it like? I'm like, oh man, the rest of it. Oh, forget <laughs> it. <laughs> if he was expecting, like, you know, oh my god, this would be the greatest thing based on the oath, and that right. was pretty much it. So, yeah, yeah no, I hear you. I hear you. There's maybe there's maybe two or three songs that I actually listen to and like, not just the oath, but the whole record as a whole. It was very different and very. Well, I think the whole thing is, do I like it? Yeah, but I I don't so much have a problem with it because music is subjective. I mean, it's art. Whatever somebody says is great is great if that's what they think. There's right, sure. But but if you look at it in rational terms, that record was so polarizing they couldn't even tour. It sounded nothing like the band that made Kiss, who you know what Kiss was about. Um, so. Is it a kind of a cool experiment? Well, in 2020, it's a fun listen, I guess. It's different. Sure. But that's not why I fell in love with Kiss at all. Of course. Again, yeah. think, but you really say the same thing about Asylum. That's not the kind of music that that I liked about Kiss because they're so obviously chasing, you know, styles and chasing what was you know the those the original records when they came out they that was a band who was trying to be a great rock and roll band and rock and they roll succeeded. they yeah, did and, yeah. you know as 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 time went on you know they tried everything from pop to heavier metal to concept to and again like michael said earlier in the episode that's what makes it so much fun 
And damn, I say this all the time on the show, but we almost never talk about the first six records because what's there to talk about? They, how, how, they how, you great. know, no, nobody's going to be able to sit here and go, the first six records suck. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if there's a single Kiss fan out there that would say, you know, like somebody would say, the elder sucks. Will anybody stand up and say the first six Kiss records suck? No, I don't no. think anybody could say that. I think there's a lot of good stuff and, you know, it's, it's when you start kind of building your brand and your sound. And I think it was a, it was a very good time for that. As we were talking before Mike about people not having a chance to develop a sound anymore. Right. And people trying, you know, like now you've got to come up with something that has three chords is a melody and that's it. That's where you're going to get for the next three I mean, minutes. You know, if, if the Kiss debut album was released today, we would never have a second album. That's yeah. my, my, my belief is that the label would have never given them a chance to go to album two, let alone album three, let alone get to a live album that finally explodes them. It's and, true. And, you, know, what, you know, and you look at anything from – Van Halen and all these other bands. It's like it took them two, three albums before they finally cemented something. Absolutely. It's, uh, well, and then, and then, one, then once success hits, then you get the elder. Because <laughs> <laughs> you think you can do no wrong. Yeah, you want to be experimental. Yeah. Well, I don't know if they even wanted to be experimental. I think, you know, Kiss, you know, from – Dynasty Unmasked Elder, you got a band that basically was huge, international stardom. I mean, completely, not, and not even within ten, a 10-year time frame. Did Lick It Up come, come right after that, right? No, Lick it, it was Elder, Creatures, Lick It Up. And okay, he, after he, Creatures. Even Creatures, we say this all the time. You know, that is the album that us as KISS fans were like, yes, they are now really back. back the whole yeah. album sounds great. The band looks great. The tour looked great. But it didn't matter because the damage had already been done. If, as we always say, timeline matters. If you were a fan back then, you know exactly what we mean when we say it was over. KISS was over. It didn't matter how great Creatures was. It right. didn't save the band, but at least as a Kiss fan, we're like, okay, they still got it in them. It's a good they, sounding they, record. It, it, it was, was a great. Well, I will tell you, Amazing. not based on everything, the promotional material, like that was the whole thing. Had had the elder taken off with those new costumes and the you know the new new romantic sort of vibe, and had that like went and, and sold double platinum, Christ, they would have stuck with it. But it did just the opposite. Hey, they Mark, couldn't I, even tour. I didn't see how they looked then. The, the record opened. It, we, right. we didn't have anything. We couldn't no, see no, no, no band picture anywhere in that yeah. album. So, so I don't remember what they looked like. You guys probably saw it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was and and you guys anyone, were like, what? Well, for anyone who still cared, magazines like, hit parader, you know, would show plus, you know, they, yeah. they did spend money on the advertising campaign and you did get to see what they looked like. And I remember going, what in the F is that, you know, <laughs> but when creatures came out, you know, they also bought like airtime for the commercials. They'd play half of, I love it loud. Yeah. And you saw like the, I love it loud video with the flames. It looked like freaking kiss again. And that was the reason they could at least tour. And keep in mind, I tell people this all the time. They played here at Kobo, here in Kobo Hall in Detroit, same yeah. place they did part of a live. And I mean, there was nine to ten thousand people in a in an arena that held twelve thousand five hundred. So it wasn't like it was empty. You know, they did okay here. Um, again, too, you, you play to ten thousand people. It's not a bad night. You know, you've been able to tour. Yeah. Um, but you know what I mean? They, in other areas, not so much. I know like Cleveland, they did okay. Uh, you know, mi and mi there was Minneapolis, other same way. It was, you know, half filled arena. I mean, as a kid, that was my first kiss concert. I didn't care. I didn't, I, it could have been just me in an entire arena and I wouldn't have cared, 
Um, but it was definitely, you know, tough for them to tour. Yeah, they were still getting press, but it was sort of like the press that was easy to get because it was all religious protesters and the preachers who were having issues with the demonic band Kiss. And, you know, it was cool that our band was in the press, but it wasn't about a great album. It was about Gene Simmons, the demon. Well, earlier we were talking about Ozzy Osbourne. And if you read Rudy Sarzo's book, which was really good, um, in 82, in 81, they were canceling a lot of their shows, too, because it, it, they weren't selling all that well. Right. Again, that's not my opinion. That's read Rudy's book. They had quite a few cancellations right when that came out. Some of it was due to the religious protesters, but some of it was plain old fashioned. You know, they didn't get the airplay. It's, it's funny to think about that now in 2020, where Ozzy's become... Ozzy, you could say Ozzy eclipsed his old band in popularity, but that was the fact in 1982. You know what I mean? That's that's what happened. So it wasn't just Kiss. You know, right. um, rock had more of an, especially here in, in the United States, rock had more of an AOR about it. I mean, Styx was huge. Ario Speedwagon was huge. Boston. You know, it, Boston yeah. Foreigner. That was more the sound. You know, whereas Kiss was going back to the heavier hard rock. And there were other bands that, you know, hit the skids in those times. Two years earlier, 1978, you know, Nugent's playing freaking stadiums with Aerosmith. 82, 83, either one of them couldn't get arrested. You know what I mean? They weren't they weren't playing the, the bigger places they were. I mean, music was going through a flux at, at, at that point. And uh, thank God we had bands like Van Halen, you know, to keep that alive and eventually Ozzy. And then, you know, the rest is history by the time, you know, the L.A. heavy metal scene, you know, kind of took over. But there was a couple years there in the early 80s. While, you know, fans, people like me, I was going crazy with, you know, Motorhead and Ozzy and Iron Maiden and stuff. But Iron Maiden wasn't on the radio. You had to go out and look for that stuff. Yeah. If you if you read, you know, the metal underground magazines like I did, that was like a big deal to me. And that was all new. It's funny you say, because it's, you look like what you said growing up, you know, in, 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 in Brazil, you did get a taste of Maiden. You, you, you did get Paul Diano's Maiden and, and that stuff made, you know, it, but that wasn't stuff you heard it, it, here in Detroit. And we're a big rock and roll town, or at least we were. You you didn't you didn't hear about Iron Maiden. You saw Iron Maiden when they were you know opening for whoever. And next thing you know, you, you know you you liked everything about it from you know from the vision of Eddie on the cover to the. But it matched the you know. It's the same thing. When I first got into Kiss, the first record that I ever saw was Hotter Than Hell because my brother brought it home, and. And I remember going, when he played it, I'm like, that sounds the way that looks. And that was the thing with, with Iron Maiden. I'm like, that sounds the way that cover looks. You know what I mean? Because if you would have put on, you know, if you would have brought home the first Iron Maiden record, and if it would have sounded like Journey, any way you want it, you'd be able to want, what the fuck? That doesn't work. No, you know it's I mean? yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, but, but that's the whole thing, you know. You really could back then you know, judged by a really cool album cover and, you know, reading about stuff like that. I remember the first time I ever heard about Motorhead, because I was a big Cream Magazine fan, the the reviewer said that it was the worst band he'd ever heard. Now, this guy, whenever I'd read his things, he always liked music I hated. So that's why I bought it. I'm like, this guy whose music taste I think sucks, says this is the worst record ever, and it's loud and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I bet you I'm going to like that. And I went and I bought it. And you liked it. And you knew yeah, it. Yeah, right? but that was, that was it, you know. That's it was funny. like being so inquisitive and, you know, um, it was just a cool time to be a rock fan. But, you know, like we said, those, you know, Ace of Spades wasn't on the fucking radio. I had to go look for that. I know. And it, it, we still might have to do, keep doing that to listen to great rock and roll, you know, unfortunately. But we've done it before. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, rock and roll will never die. Yes, it'll go up and down in popularity, but rock and roll will always be there. I mean, to some extent, we were spoiled during 
you know, the 70s and 80s when rock and roll and hard rock and hair metal and, and heavy metal and thrash metal were everything, especially because MTV for a few years was totally yeah. behind it. You felt like you were, you know, at the top of the mountain and no one's going to knock you down. Well, you can't stay at that peak of the mountain forever. There's still rock out there. I mean, there's yeah. so much great rock being released Absolutely. right now. You just got to go look for it because radio's not bringing it to you. Video's not bringing it to you. Press isn't bringing it to you anymore. You got to go find your own great rock. And, and again, it's out there. There's so many bands like, you know, your band Magnetico. that are out there releasing, that are releasing yeah. music. And it's like, go find it people go we we always tell our listeners it's like step outside of your kiss comfort zone you don't have to listen to kiss 24 7 there's a lot and and stepping out of your comfort zone doesn't mean stopping kiss and then listen to ozzy or listen yeah. to judas priest we know that's all great go find a brand new band or even go find an old band that you've never heard of before they might be 40 years old and you're going, wow, this first album is just killer. I've never heard these guys. There's so much of that out there. I'm sure, man. I do agree with you guys. And, you know, if we have to go back and, and do the research, as you say, we've done it in the past. So, yeah, I mean, Mark, Mark, I mean, how, how did we in the eighties, how did we find new bands? We did research through things like Kerrang magazine. Yep. You're absolutely we right. We our friends. We got it through the, the right media outlets. We didn't sit back and wait for the music editor and the Detroit Free Press to tell you this was good. Plus, too, I mean, back then I used to love the Bills. I remember the first time I saw, like, Vandenberg and I saw ha – Yep. And, <clears throat> you know, all those bands back then. Matter of fact, first time I saw Iron Maiden, they were opening for Judas Priest. I mean – I, I put it this way. If you weren't even a metal kid, or excuse me, if you didn't read those magazines, I remember seeing um, uh, Metallica open for Ozzy. I saw, I saw Motley Crue open for Ozzy. I can't tell you, you how many I mean? times I saw Saxon opening and Crocus sure. opening yes. and, and, and MSG, the Michael Shanker group opening. Bands that I had remotely heard their names before because they were in Kerrang!, but you hadn't heard their music anywhere. No, and before they're, they're, our, they're on a they're on a tour. You know, I don't. Know, Saxon's opening for Cheap Trick. It's like, wow, I'm going out and getting that Saxon album. I I and, and again, guys, just to prove a point, and it wasn't all that long ago. You know, our former guest Joey. I, I didn't know who ZO2 was, but I was going to a bunch of Kiss shows that summer, and I just wanted to check them out. I saw one ZO2 show, and guess what? I was never late for a, a show for the rest of the tour. I thought that band was dynamite. I genuinely liked them before I got, you know, we got to know Joey, but that band was freaking awesome. Matter of fact, so much so when they, when they, when ZO2 came to Detroit, they were playing some little clubs around here doing their own independent tours. I got a hold of the promoter, and I'm like, hey, can I put my band on, on that bill? I said, I really like this band. I saw them tour with Kiss. And we ended up doing a couple shows with them. And that's kind of the thing. You know, I don't care if it's the Kiss Tour or Iron Maiden Tour or whoever. I will see if if who's opening. Now, now we get to cheat a little bit because if I see somebody, I'll go on YouTube and check it out. Because, you know, there for a while there, and even Kiss was doing it, I, I cannot stand Screamo. I just can't. Anything that has that sort of. Uh, well, let, let's let's be honest. During the reunion, the Kiss reunion tour, there were a lot of questionable opening acts. Well, that's that's exactly my point, Michael. I, there were some bands. I'm like, why is this bill even together? This is fucking horrible. And I remember doing that even too at Ozfest. I'm like, skip, skip, skip. I'll go see them. Skip that one. I'll go to the second stage. Watch that one. You know what I mean? Because again, I, I don't want to sit and listen to. <laughs> What the <laughs> fuck is that? Ugh. It's, to this day, I don't know how that stuff even took off, you know? Yeah, no, I, I hear you, man. I hear you. I hear your pain. But, you know, some people like it. It's weird. 
I, I, I prefer bands that will sing. I like, I yes. love music, you know? I, yeah. I, 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 at, at one point, I, at one point I really enjoy Pantera. Phil and Selma can sing. He does have that side of it once in a while, but he's a great singer when he's, you know, it's, but I, you know, I think I'm rather hear somebody sing. I, 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 I want to hear a singer. I want to hear melodies. I want to hear. Absolutely. I want to hear beautiful choruses, you know, all of that stuff. And, and, and listen, I think Kiss is delivered on all of that from the first album on. True. Absolutely. Certainly gave us a lot to love. That's for sure. Yep. Javier, this was awesome. Thank you so much for joining us, talking Kiss, giving us a little insight into Paul Stanley and Soul Station and his solo band. Um, I can tell you, I'm so looking forward to the Soul Station release whenever that happens. And knock on wood, hopefully he does a a mini tour. <laughs> you know, that would uh, be awesome. Michael, it was great meeting you here. Thank you so much, Mark. It's great to see you. I'm so happy I made it. You know, you guys had me today, and I uh, want to thank you both, and Tommy and Eric. And uh, I hope I can come back one one oh, of those days. And you, 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 sure. you know you what? Come come back. Day. You know, when the album comes out, comes out, come back and bring your lead singer on with you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'll drag Paul with me. Yes. <laughs> That would be incredible. Well, well, thank you so much. You are an incredible guest. Uh, thank you for sharing your passion with, of music, which when you boil this show down, yeah, is it a, is it a Kiss theme? But it's really about music. I appreciate it, Mark. We just love music. This has, been a, this has been a lot of fun for me. Thank you guys again. Uh, I just want to let everybody out there know that I am available for, you know, guitar work. <laughs> and production and anything you just visit my website at www.rafaelmarera.com and again thank you mark and mike you guys were great awesome. i really appreciate thank you both. thank and you for sitting Tommy. down with us for almost two hours here yeah it's been my pleasure man great take care man you guys have a great day man you too. great rest of your day bye-bye that was that was an awesome conversation i mean I guess, you know, whether it's because I didn't do a lot of show prep, I didn't realize he was as big a KISS fan as he is. Show, and that, show that, prep. Sh yeah, show, what's show prep? That's like, oh, it's 10 minutes to record time. I best put pants on. You know, that's show prep. <laughs> that's show prep. <laughs> um, you know, but, but it was just cool getting his insight because, you know, he was there for the Paul Stanley solo band and he's there for Paul Stanley Soul Station. I, I just want I don't if you guys don't check him out, um, that guy is a master class musician. I'm not talking about, you know, the best guy in the local scene. I'm talking master class musician. There's a reason that somebody of Paul Stanley's stature exactly went, um, that guy. There's a reason that this guy can come over from Brazil and eventually makes it onto a national Goes TV. from Christina Aguilera to Pink to the rock star show to Paul yeah. Stanley to Soul yeah. Station. And I'm sure we're missing a lot of stuff in there. But Co Correct. And, you know, um, I, that's how I found out about him. Eric was going, hey, you know, you guys should have Raphael on. We we're just talking. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I didn't even think about it. He, he actually suggested him to come on. And I hope you guys really dug it. Um, and... Let me tell you that that guy can play, so uh, uh, I would highly uh, encourage you guys to check out uh, you know his stuff. And if you've been on the Kiss cruise, you've seen him play. He's been on the last couple of cruises. Yeah, his, his band has been on the cruise. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, yep. and what a super nice person! God, he was so yep. fun to talk to yep. and love his passion and just what a you know, big smile on his face. The world needs more of that. Oh yeah, very, for sure. Very, uh, very I, happy. I, I would say for homework this week. Um, what, what, what do you think about soul station? Are you excited for Paul's album? Are you excited if he does a couple, does some shows? Um, 
as I said, I'm, I'm definitely excited. I mean, anything Paul Stanley records and releases excites me. Even knowing that Soul Station is not Kiss, I'm excited because let's be honest, Paul Stanley is, you know, one of a kind. Um, so what's your feelings on Soul Station? And did you see Afiel on Paul's solo tour? What'd you think? Were you fortunate to see one of the few Soul Station live shows? And what did you think? Yeah, they need to tour that when uh, touring gets back going. Yeah. I, and and I, I got even more excited about the Soul Station album when I heard recently that Paul's got four original tunes that he wrote for it. It's like, oh, yes. Original Paul Stanley music. Can't wait. Can't wait. Can't wait. So there's some homework. Um, you know where to go. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. We're everywhere. Leave us your answers. And, of course, if you're watching us on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. Follow us on Spotify. Subscribe and leave a review and rating on iTunes. And that's it. I think we got us a guest, another guest next week. Somebody coming from the land down under joining us next week. All right, that's it. Three sides of the coin. We're out of here. See everybody next week. <clears throat>